Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to another episode of Boys in the Cave. I'm joined by my co-host Raphael. Um, but I'm like, we're actually joined by um, a special guest um, and we're very honored to have you on board simply because we have a lot of viewers in um, America and UK, but I guess those people aren't aware about the Sydney scene or the Australian scene as much. So with our guest today, he's actually been in the media quite a bit. He's been writing books and his name is Tanzil Ali. So Tanzil Ali is a four-time Australian memory champion and executive memory coach. He's a keynote speaker and he's famously known for memorizing two yellow page phone books in only 24 days. An international best-selling author of the books, The Yellow Elephant and How to Learn Almost Anything in 48 Hours. Tanzil is a celebrity ambassador for Crohn's and Colitis Australia and managing director of Tanzil Institute, organizing professional development events and mentorship programs. Tanzil possesses two master's degrees in IT and MBA and works with high profile organizations and individuals to significantly enhance their mental performance to achieve success. So um, that's pretty much his bio. It's probably a long one on LinkedIn, but assalamu alaikum, Tanzil Ali, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Walaikum salam. Thanks for having me on. Anytime, yeah. So as I mentioned, you've been, um, before we started recording, you've actually been quite, you know, um, visible in the media in regards to being Muslim. And I've actually read your stuff, so you've got some interesting blogs that we can probably discuss in detail later. But essentially, here in the Australian scene, um, Raphael can probably um, hone in on his thoughts, but... We see Walid Ali because he's the host of um, Channel 10. Was it the project? Yeah. Yeah. So he's like the only kind of Muslim personality out there. I'm, there might be others that might be skipping my we mind. Have like Usman Khawaja. Okay. He doesn't count. Cricket out, but like, and, <laughs> and we have, you know, a couple of footballers probably and, and you know, sportsmen. But in the kind of media scene, it, it, it's, yeah, you don't see like just Muslims floating about doing things that they're, you know, experts in or or being, you know, demonstrated as just everyday Australian professionals or experts. And I think it's really important uh, that we sort of pay attention to this and, and bring, bring these people forward to the, to the attention of both the Muslim community and the, and the wider community as well. Exactly, because at the end of the day, you, um, we'll go into um, what you specialize in, Tanzil, but you've got a specific niche, and I, that's what I love because as a Muslim, like, it makes people coming to you and, you know, it, it makes us feel kind of important. Like, it makes me feel happy. I don't know yeah, if that yeah. makes – if my feel weird you out a bit. But um, <laughs> what's your kind of um, experiences so far? What's been your memorable, memorable uh, moment in regards to um, doing what you're doing at the moment? Yeah. Um, thanks for those words, by the way. Um, and, in fact, we've, we've got quite a few Muslims out there, alhamdulillah, uh, really doing well. Nazim Hussain's another one as well uh that was uh that was mentioned and look i know so many others as well but it's not so much the people that are you know well known out there but there's also as you know a lot of the people that volunteer their time and effort and do so much but don't get really recognized as well so um you know there's there's so many uh, amazing people out there that i i actually get inspired from and people like yourselves as well that you know really work towards uh, bringing some value to listeners um, and inspiration. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for that as well. So getting back to, I guess, my stuff is um, it's, it's more about, for me, it was all about helping people because um, I, I never really believed I had a good memory. In fact, I, I actually didn't. And it was just pure by chance that a friend was, um, you know, he came up to me and said, Tansel, I can remember 40 random objects back to front, any order. And I said, you know, no, you can't. And I had to test him. And after I tested him, uh, he memorized everything and I thought he was cheating or doing something, you know, writing them down. And he said, no, it's just memory techniques. So um, that sort of sparked my interest. And I thought, well, memory techniques? I've got a shocking memory. How does this stuff work? Um, then I started reading and researching and doing everything. And surely enough, um, there were techniques out there. And as you start sort of reading a lot more and um, venturing into a topic like this, um, you realize that, yeah, it's, it's actually not a trick that – you can improve your memory. And ever since then, I thought, well, if I can do it for myself, I can help other people. So I guess my, you know, journey has been, you know, how can I best help people to not just improve their memory, but enhance their lives to everything uh, that memory brings. Yeah, exactly. And I think it shows that, I guess, through your particular experiences, you're able to develop um, something in regards to how to improve the overall kind of 
performance of a human being? Because that's actually what I want. I wanted to ask you that. How do you see? Um, why do you feel memorization is is important? Because it for we can see it applying to all facets of you know um, life in general. I don't know. People can use it for I don't know. Memorize the amount of numbers of girls that they get to memorizing. I don't know data in a computer. You know what I mean? Like it can be used for almost anything. But in from your kind of experience, what sort of um, what does memorization provide the most benefits for? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because when people think of memory, they just think of remembering stuff, right? Numbers or words or lists or you know things that have to do with actual memorization and, and recalling. But what I've found over the years, and I've been doing this for the last 16 years, is that uh, the more you delve into memorization, the more you're actually enhancing your mental ability. So you become more creative. Uh, you become a better problem solver, strategist. Um, and that's what led me to becoming a, a coach. I started helping people or creating strategies on how they can become you know, better in their careers or better in their everyday life. You know, so things like how to manage stress and anxiety, how to manage pain, because uh, I, I suffer from a chronic illness and been hospitalized uh, many, many times and operated on. So I use this on myself and manage to essentially heal uh, a lot of pain. So there's a lot of um, uh, benefits from training your memory and a, a lot of it people just don't know. So uh, hence what I do is I, I try and get out there with all this deep level information aside from just here, yeah, learn how to speed read. Well, it's more than that. It's, yeah, sorry, Ref. Yeah, no, I was going to say that's, that's absolutely incredible. Um, <clears throat> so how, how does memory really become this kind of medicinal thing? Uh, how, do, how do you get from, you know, having this, this gift to being able to actually, basically, as you mentioned, um, you know, make, make uh, yourself feel more positive and, and have these, you know, even these physical benefits, like you mentioned, the chronic illness, making that feel better and so forth. Yeah. Well, memory is essentially a visualization process. Right. When we think of memory in general, if we don't know techniques, we just think of repetition, right? We're going to repeat things over and over again. I mean, you know, you memorize Quran. How many times do you read it over and over and still forget, right? Um, just stuff like that. When we're studying, we just repeat over and over. But what most people don't know is that it's about creating stories and images in your head, right? Once you're able to create these stories and images, they, these are through actually memory techniques and memory principles. So, you, you know, you go out and learn them. Once you're able to do this, then you're able to do amazing things like remember. But the, again, the side benefit, as I mentioned from that, is you create these stories in your head. Now, what happens? Let's say you're stressed, right? What happens when you're stressed? You have a, a story built up in your head, don't you? Right? You've got these stories. So the best way to change that story or alter it or create a new one is to create new images and new stories. And what memory training does is because you've worked on that uh, element, worked on that and trained your visual capacity, you can create a better story. You can change uh, your feelings. You can change emotions um, a lot faster than what you're able to do before. And that, that's, that's, you know, that's life-changing. And I've worked with people that have come to me crying, you know, asking for help. And by the end, they, they say, look, you've changed my life. Thank you so much. You know, they were crying first from all the pain and now they're crying from the happiness, right? And who would have thought by, you know, showing memory techniques that this could happen? So that, that's, that's the power of it. You've got to look at it like physical training, right? You know, when we go physical, let's say we go gym or exercise, right? The more and more we do those things, uh, we build up, what, muscle or we get fit and we see those changes, right? But if we're training our brain, if we're, you know, training memory, right, what do we see? We don't necessarily see anything. People don't see nothing, right? But you feel it internally. You feel it. So there's so many elements out there. But because people don't see um, the memory at play, like we don't see our heads going suddenly bigger and bigger, do we, <laughs> in the shape of a brain? It doesn't happen. So it's more about just training and really trusting the process. So yeah, I think that something really interesting that you brought up there was the kind of link between imagination and memory. Um, so it seems that you know a lot of memorizing things, like think like concepts such as building memory palaces. I've never really thought about before, but 
Is there a link between imagination and memory? And if so, like how important is imagination? Yeah, well, imagination is the tool essentially you need to improve that memory or to train that memory element. So you can't really train it without because um, otherwise if you just say look at a whole bunch of words and numbers, it, it's a different part of the brain. So what you need to be able to do is you need to use uh, another part of the brain that does process images and connect that to the words and numbers and things like that. So you're actually using what they say both sides of your brain instead of just the one part. And when you look at schooling, uh, what do they show us? You know, you write essays, words, there's numbers. You know, the reason why people fail maths and they're really bad at maths is because they, they encode numbers differently, right? Or they don't even encode them at all. It's just, you know, gobbledygook. It's just a different language. So once you're able to use this visual part, then you can absolutely smash maths. You can do really, really well. You, you can, uh, nothing's difficult, right? You can do whatever you want. So that that's the huge difference of, using imagination uh, versus your traditional methods. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a world's apart. Okay, because I have a question for you about this vis- visualization because from my um, going about the educa- education system, I've noticed that people are different types of learners, right? So you're bringing this visualization element to um, the whole idea of memorization would you say from your experiences that generally people have different ways of um, remembering things? So pe- you need to treat everyone differently. Like, for example, people that you coach, for example, well, is that um, the case you've had in regards to um, teaching people how to memorize effectively? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I used to be a trainer for many, many years, over 10 years. And, you know, we, we train according to different learning styles and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's whatever that person has in their head and how they manipulate that. That's the most important way. So really memory is all about practical application, right? You can visualize and stuff and you can train it. But, you know, unless you actually put it to use, then you're not going to get benefit out of it. Imagine you had all the money in the world, right, sitting in front of you, but you're not doing anything. You're just staring at it, right? (laughs) It's not much use, is it, right? Um, It's not much use. Uh, You're laughing because you've got some there. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's, it's the same thing with knowledge, uh, right? So if you've got all the the best knowledge in the world, but yet, you know, you're not doing anything with it, it, it's kind of pointless. So the same thing happens with memory as well. You can visualize stuff all you want. You can, you know, make up stories till the cows come home, right? But unless you actually use it in real life, like to remember people's names or, you know, to improve your lifestyle or to manage pain, things that I talked about before, um, yeah, it's not really going to help. So it, it's all about doing rather than just thinking about it. Okay, because you brought up the idea of um, doing. So, uh how does someone go about starting off if they want to improve the memory? Okay, like for example, let's, I can be the case study here. Like I have pretty bad memory because, oh, actually I read some of your stuff. You're just like, you can't say that because you can always train it. So at this point in time, like, you know, for example, um, actually um, I'm poor with um, remembering people's names and all that kind of stuff. So if I'm the case study, where should I start off in regards to improving my memory? Names is a classic one. Um, I mean, improve my memory. A lot of people say the internet's making us dumber. Have you have you heard that before? That's why I always or, uh, they, they blame technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, if it wasn't for the internet, I wouldn't be here talking to you today, <laughs> to be honest, because yeah. it was Google that you know helped me. So there's a little tip for you: search how to improve memory on Google, and you'll come up with a lot of information, uh, including my sites and stuff. So it's all there. All the information's in front of us, right? We're not starving for information. In fact we've got too much of it right um so but my friend uh, he usually says look we're, we're drowning in information um but you know we're, we're lacking sort of inspiration um and that that usually comes about through practice and trial and stuff like that so in order to start it's about getting the knowledge in your head and then trying it out testing it 
and see how you go. So, for example, with names, it's really quite an easy concept, right? A name, as I was mentioning before, it doesn't make any sense, right? All this abstract information, different part of the brain, it's just a word, right? And that's why people forget names because it's just a word that has no meaning. So if we put meaning to it, if you create an image, if we visualize it, then it's a lot easier to remember. So, for example, right, my name, Tansel, right? Some people get it, some people don't. In fact, most people don't because it's quite confusing for them. Right, but if I was to say tinsel, tonsil, you know, uh, Hansel and Gretel, you know, uh, someone, uh, some, uh, this is an, an imam yelled this out to me years ago. He said, "Hey, you tinsel." Right? So imagine someone saying that. Now that's given you an image in yeah. your head, right? And you can use that and manipulate that image in a story format. So imagine someone put tinsel around my head and put me on top of a Christmas tree, right? Now that's a little. That's a little story, yeah. right? And the weirder you make it, the crazier you make it, the easier it is to recall, right? So you meet someone named John. What can you do? Um, John. Um, yeah, I'm not creative. Like, think of John. I think of Jill, and I think of Jack and Jill went up the hill. I don't know. And then yeah, I think that's of good. So as long as you have images, you can play around with it, right? So if I think of a John, my father-in-law's name's John. So I think of him, right? And he loves playing golf. So I can imagine, you know, golf sticks and all that sort of stuff, clubs, whatever they're called. Um, but also you can think of a toilet, like a John. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was a pretty dramatic, um, yeah. like, <laughs> it's like one from golf and one the toilet. <laughs> I tried to build it up. But, um, you know, it's, it's all about using that visual element. I mean, next time he's meet a John, imagine them just kicking back in the toilet, you know, reading a book or something. <laughs> This is crazy. All right, cause, all right, um, are you down for a case? Let's just do like a role play. Is that all right? So um, I thought about it. So we'll do like a name memorization. So you guys, all right, so actually, do you want to do a rap? You, uh, you guess the name or? Yeah. Because well, Tans will obviously win because like he's yeah. the memory no, I'll master. I'll take him on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll, we'll take turns actually. So how about Raphael, um, you you remember our names and me and Tans will, will have to come up with random names. Uh, what's the best way you should we should do it? So I don't know what you're trying to do, man. <laughs> oh, okay, because we'll come up with random names and we'll get Raf to mem- remember them. Yeah, but yes, no, no, Raf, we'll, you'll make a story out of it. Yeah, yeah. That. So yeah. we'll, I'll come up with a random name, and you, um, Tans will come up with a random name, and then Rafa will come up with a crazy story to remember. Beautiful. That name. So maybe three or four or five names. Oh yeah, three, four, yeah, five names. See if I can How about them so them two? Them. I'll do two names, and yeah. Tans will do two names. Yeah. yeah? Let's see if I can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you can start off tenso, actually. Okay. L- let's say Bob. Uh, Bob. <laughs> Difficult one. He, he's a jellyfish. He bobs in the water. Bobs in the water. How yeah. does he bob in the water? No. Okay. You know. Is that what? You, yeah, like, that's it. Tanzim, this, this is um, it, this is quite cool actually, because what you can do is things that don't make sense. You know how he said, you know, how does he bob in the water, right? Um, that's what makes you remember. <laughs> Because if it doesn't make sense, your brain's going to question it and you remember it even better. So, you know, try and pick things that are really odd and doesn't even have to make sense. So that's a good one, jelly bobbing up and down in the water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'll do one then. Um, how about um, Claudius? Uh-huh. Claudius. Is that for me, is it? <laughs> no, it's for Raphael. So we'll do a cup for Raphael and we'll switch around. Yeah. Claudius sounds like a nasty kind of bacterial infection that you don't want to get. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. A really nasty green rash, yeah. maybe on his thigh or something. Okay, can I uh, add audience. on to that? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's actually a nasty virus caused by Santa Claus coming down the chimney. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, true story. It's it coming down the chimney, and you know, when they touch, you know, when he touches the cookies and stuff, um, you know, it doesn't eat all of them, so the virus just spreads. So I'm making a friend of that. It's called the Claud- Claudius. Yeah. So. I feel like we're tapping into Tanzel's mind now. We know how like the keys to our yeah. memorizing. So. That's it. You don't need me anymore. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how about I'll actually we'll do it for Tanzel. We'll see what you come up with since um we've now I've got an idea of how crazy your stories are. Is this um, genuinely though how you memorize? Names. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I've still got the record in Australia for memorizing the most names, and this is all I do. <laughs> well, well. Oh, yeah, let's have a sneak peek. All right, so all right, I'll do a. Uh, what's a hard one? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll think. 
I think of like a what's a. Uh, yeah, I think a quick one. Bengali name. Oh yeah, I'll pick a Bengali name. All right, so we have. Um, she, I don't know many Bengali names. They're all like they're all Muhammad and stuff. Yeah, that's it. That's the only Bengali. Um, name. I'll think. How about um? Uh, actually, you go first. I'll think of uh, Ashrafu. <laughs> Do you hear that clearly? Ashrafu. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's quite easy because I know an Ashraf. Oh, right? So if you okay. know someone. You can use that to your advantage. So I know an Ashraf, right? He's, he's a you know a friend of mine's son, uh, quite a you know lovely young man, and he loves his food, right? So I'm just connecting it to food, foo. So Ashraf foo. Oh, whoa, that's actually so good. Yeah, so yeah. my one would be um, Mustafizur. Mustafizur. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard that before. It's actually a Bangladeshi cricketer. He's a bowler. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I pretty much gave it. Like, actually, you have a different perception because you don't. You might not follow cricket. So, yeah. What, what do you think? Um, what's your story for the name? Yeah. Look, uh, Mustafa is in there. Yeah. Right. So I can think of a Mustafa. And remember, the the spelling doesn't have to be correct because it's just a trigger, right? Mm-hmm. Your images, stories that you make, just a trigger, right? So I, I think of a Mustafa again, someone I know. Um, um, it's a very common name, someone I know. So Mustafa and Fizzle. So he's fizzing, oh. like he's got a soda can or something, and it's fizzing. You know, while he's bowling that, oh. <laughs> he's, he's bowling a spin. Is he a spinner? <laughs> he's probably bowling that. That's a, funny you bring that up because Mustafa Fizzle, he's famous for. He's a left arm pace bowler, and he's famous for. Um, he can make a rip with his left um left arm pace. So he's like a, he's, they almost call him like an off spinner. Because he can give it a rip. So, it's actually funny you brought that up. And his nickname's Fizz. Fizz, yeah. yeah. Fizz, that's it. So, well, so actually, let it, let it rip, Fizz. I think we've cracked another code because now what I'm seeing is that you're relating it to people that you know. And it actually makes it a lot easier if you pinpoint. Look, there, there's a few techniques. There's a few techniques. There's people that you know. There's locations. So, for example, if you meet, let's say, an Elizabeth, right? Uh, you can, instead of picturing Queen Elizabeth, you could picture Buckingham Palace, Right, um, so you actually get the location. Another one is you know playing around with the names that we talked about. Um, there, there's there's a few techniques in there, but the more names we get, maybe we can play around with them as well. Can I give you one? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm down. I've got one in my head. All right, you ready? Yep. Okay, I used to work with this guy, so this is you know real life. Um, not mucking around. His name is VJ Arangan Ramachandran. VJ, what? Sorry. VJ Arangan Ramachandran. VJ Araranga Chandran. You, you can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Can you say, all right, um, I know the first part, VJ. So, morally, VJ is a cricketer. So, I'll remember the first part pretty easily. What's the middle part? Uh, VJ Arangan. Arangan. Um, Arangan. Ara. So, Arong is a shop in Bangladesh called, mm-hmm. so I can remember Arong. Is it called, it's yep. pronounced Arang, right? Uh, Arangan. Arangan. So, gun. Like, I remember, all right, how yep. the... The Arong, which is the shop in Bangladesh, they ha- they sell guns. Yeah. They don't sell guns, yeah. but let's just picture them selling guns. So yeah, Arang yeah, gun. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So VJ Arang gun, and what's the last part? Rama. 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 I think of the Hindu, the worship Rama. Yep. So yeah, yeah, Rama. Rama, and the last one's Chandran. Chandran. Ch- yep. Chan. Ch- Chanda. You know how like a slang for chandering in <laughs> the Chanda alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like Chan, which means like moon. In yeah, there's uh, yeah. there's that as well. Chandran was it? Was it Chan? So what was the last part? Sorry, how do you pronounce it? Uh, run Chandran Chandran. So I can uh, yeah, I'll go with the moon. So Chandran and then run. So you run away from the moon or something. All right. So what was the name? Okay, uh, VJ. Um, yeah. What's the middle? Oh yeah. So um, Arang Gun because they sell guns. Yep. <laughs> Rama, so that's the what the Hindus worship, and then at the end is I just forgot. Wait, wait, I remember. Now. Oh yeah, Chan Ch- Chandra Gun. No, no, so Chandra something. <laughs> What's the last part? It was um, I believe VJ Arang Gun Gun Rama Chandra, Rama Tran, Chandra Run. Yeah, run away from the moon. Yeah. I was thinking because Chandra is a werewolf, so he runs away from the Chan, so he runs away from the moon. Ah. So, is that right? That's right. Oh, well. That's actually pretty impressive because as you mentioned, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I'm actually very poor with names. And so, I pretty much like 
getting you know back and forth with me and you, I've actually picked up something already because visualization, I, I've actually realized it is um, the way I personally learn, but I didn't know how to incorporate it in regards to memorizing because memorizing seems like, as you mentioned before, it's to do with like we're perceived it as like um, just writing something and just saying it over and over again. And actually, I want to touch on something you mentioned earlier about memorizing the Quran because when we're young, we're brought up, um, you just repeat it over and over and over again. And I actually read your, I read your article on this about um, using a mind palace to memorize the Quran. Um, we can actually um, go into that a bit more. So is this technique, you, have you come across it before in regards to uh, Muslims um, you know, memorizing the Quran or is this your kind of incorporating of your skills into another skill, you get me? Yeah, look, um, it's something that, it's funny because in the memory championships, we have an event, well, we used to have an event. It, it was a random poem, right? And the poem was non-rhyming. So we had to memorize it and, you know, people would be memorizing page after page in 15 minutes, right? And uh, I, I, I was pretty bad at it, but I still remember a whole page, right, uh, of uh, words. And it was about 120 words or so, 100 words in 15 minutes that we'd get. Um, and we'd have to memorize it perfectly. I mean, one mistake and, you know, we, we get, um, yeah, we pretty much get zero. Yeah. So we, we were doing that event and then I realized, well, I wonder if you can apply the same technique for memorizing Quran. So I tested it out, and surely enough, it worked. I mean, I tested it on Surah Yasin, which I knew as a little kid, but then ended up forgetting it, um, you know, as I got older. So I tested it out, and Surah Yasin's got what, 83 um, ayats, right? So I did, you know, 83 locations wow. and tested it out, and surely enough, 10 minutes, I memorized the whole thing. 10 minutes? <laughs> I'm like, cool. I mean, I knew it before, yeah, so yeah, when you right. know something, it's a bit quicker. Uh, but 10 minutes, I mean, I memorized it. And the good thing with these techniques is that you don't just memorize it, you can keep it in there. Because recall is the most important thing, not, not memorization, because you can remember something, right? You can memorize it, but you can still forget it again as well. It's like studying. Yeah. You know, you memorize it for that exam, and then after that, you forget. It. But when you're using techniques, you can actually store it in there, and, and it stays wow. in there. Um, so that's, that's a beautiful thing uh, about these memory techniques. So that's how... I guess I came about the Quran memorization and I ran workshops straight away. You know, I ran them in mosques and, you know, interstate and um, got some really good results. You know, people were actually memorizing stuff. But I think the most important thing that came from that was, you know, when I asked people, you know, how often do you, you know, do you even read Quran? They go, um, <laughs> they can't answer it. I go, well, yeah. why are you trying to memorize it if, if you don't even read it? So, you know, <laughs> priorities, <laughs> I guess. But, the, but, you know, the techniques help inspire you to actually read um, and memorize rather than um, try and get a habit of, you know, reading. That's actually pretty amazing. I feel like we are revolutionizing the Islamic yeah, exactly. scene <laughs> on Boys in the Cave because people, because you grow up or even when I go to um, Bangladesh and you look at people, like, it's pretty, it looks pretty boring and stale. Like you have the Molana subs or the, the yeah, chefs. Exactly. There's, the, kind of stick involved, there's a stick and there's like kids. a line of like kids going across and they're just repeating. They feel like, I don't know what, they feel like they they don't want to be there. And they're just like repeating over and over again the, um, versus the Quran. And then if they say something wrong, they get smacked. And, you know, it... That's the, how I learned, man. That's how I learned as well. I mean, I used to be a Quran memorization teacher when I was 10 years old, believe it or not. Oh, but I, I wasn't using these techniques. It was all repetition, right? Because that, that's when... They, they used to call me the little Hafiz kid, believe it or not, when oh, I was 10 years old. Because I used to read Surah Yasin at the mosque. Because I used to live right across the mosque, and we used to, you know, straight after prayer read Yasin. So they'd always call me the little Huffers kid. Um, it's funny how it sort of, you know, comes back yeah. after years later. But you know, I still just teach repetition, and it was the same sort of thing: repeat over and over again. And you know, um, it, it's it's challenging, really, really challenging. And I didn't have the greatest memory, but I, I just persisted. I guess that was my thing. Um, my skill was persistence. Okay, yeah, that's interesting you bring that up because I think. That brings a different kind of skill into play, um, persistence, but then you're going down the route of more efficiency. So the way you build images and, you know, pictures and locations, it's more efficient. Like, as you mentioned, like you able to re-memorize Surah Yasin in like 10 minutes. That's pretty, I, don't, I, th I think that's pretty much unheard of, essentially. That, Oh, look, I think people have done it just as fast using traditional methods. But again, even traditional methods, they have to, uh, you know, those people memorizing that quick, it's still visually, they're still using visual methods. It's just that some people aren't aware of what's going on 
in terms of memory wise, but once you understand how memory works, you go, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. So I've come across people like that as well, uh, right? But the key is to actually know these techniques. And once you're putting them in, uh, like you said, the memory palace, as it's like, you know, when you create folders on your computer and you say, I'm just going to put the information in here, all the files, that's what you're doing, right? You're creating those folders so that whenever you need that information, you go to the folder because you know where it's stored and take the information out. That's what's happening with memory techniques, whereas traditional methods, you haven't got storage spot. You're just relying on what you've, you know, visualized or what you've repeated over and over again. So, yeah, big difference. I was just going to ask, and I think it relates to, you know, what you just mentioned about being a little half as kid, but um, was your memory something that you were, like, probably you had a gift in it, you probably gifted with, with quite a lot of success academically at school, I'd imagine. But how did you come to discover all these things for yourself? Like, what was the process? Did someone teach you uh, and talk to you the same way that you're telling us about it now? Or was it something that you came about yourself? Yeah, look, um, I mean, I wasn't that gifted at school, to be honest. Or I, I always had a bad memory. Um, always, always had a bad memory. I mean, I teach memory techniques, but I was just, like I said, good at persistence and that's it. So I wasn't necessarily having a good memory. Um, at school, I mean, I, I tried. I was creative. I guess that was my element, but I was never a high-scoring student. Um, even I just barely got into uni doing arts, right? So I was, you know, very, very lucky. Um, and arts, you know, in Melbourne had one of the lowest scores to get into uni. So that's what I did, and I sort of just went through that and, you know, got into IT because I've always wanted to get into IT. So I was very fortunate from there. But even then, I'd fail, you know, math subjects like four times in a row. So I delayed getting my degree for four years. You know, stuff like that. So I, I did struggle academically a lot. Um, but, you know, they, these things sort of come across, um, it's funny, by, you know, for me being curious. I mean, if you're curious about this stuff, you'll go and research it, yeah? You'll Google it. You'll do whatever and then find out, oh, wow, it actually does work when you experience it. Like I said, you know, my friend came up to me and showed me, the you know, what, what he was able to remember. So um, if you've got that curiousness if you've got an open mind to learning you, you can do so much but if you've got a closed off mind saying that nah, this can't be done or you know are oh, they just gifted then to be honest you're, you're blocking out what you know you're really able to achieve so i think having an open mind being curious is really a fundamental of you know being successful and obviously the persistent stuff as well um, I wanted to ask you about the idea of, you know, because you mentioned you initially had a bad memory and I've reiterated that I have a bad memory as well. So, because if you actually look back in um, Islamic history and especially with the scholars in the past, a lot of them, um, <clears throat> I think Imam Shafi had like a pretty much yeah, photograph. photographic memory. Um, I think there was a story, I think Imam Ghazali, I don't know which scholar it was, I think it was Imam Ghazali, like some, he lost all these books and then he's like, that was a sign for Allah to show that I need to memorize all the yeah, books. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. So I'm, I'm sure we've all heard it a million times before. Yeah. But basically, he was robbed, like a, a group of brigands came to rob his caravan. And one of them threatened to take his books. And he said, please don't take that. All my knowledge is contained in those books. And the brigand said, what kind of uh, scholar are you? Who all his knowledge, like if I take away your books, uh, I take away your knowledge. You know, and I thought that was really profound. So we have these kind of instances in uh, in history, and especially with Imam Shafi, since he has like a photographic memory. So, do you feel that some people are just gifted in regards to you know how we had the technique of just repetition? They just see it and it's in their mind. Some people are just gifted like that, but then for I guess rest of society, it's about us to kind of figure it out. Or is it that even someone like Imam Shafi probably worked on? memorization techniques to get to where he yeah, was whether they knew it or not they were inadvertent good techniques i wonder what you think about that and, and most if you you'd know a lot more about the great memories uh in the world and in history but do you think that most of them were visual learners and visual memorizers Sorry. look i think with memory what happens is uh visual capability is one thing and then if you want to really remember it, you add emotions on there now when you look at you know these great scholars um you know, tell me they weren't emotional about Islam and they weren't feeling it, right? You read one thing and it's just going to go boom, hit your heart, right? So if something does that, you're going to remember it. <laughs> you're going to remember it, right? So it's on a, a level where that maybe we can't comprehend because we don't get that emotional, right? Yeah, you can cry about Islam or all that sort of stuff, but these guys took it to another level, right? So it's all about, 
um, not just visualization, but emotion. Um, that, that's where you really get the energy coming um, into the brain, heart, gut. Um, all that sort of stuff. So that's what they were doing. And, and it's not just the Islamic scholars. You've you got the Buddhist monks and, you know, in Christian faith and all, all that sort of stuff. You've got really highly devoted people, um, you know, passionate, enthusiastic and highly emotional state. Uh, and when they're praying, they're in that state as well. So imagine their capability when they go and read something. It, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Well, I didn't think of it in that manner, the emotional kind of connection and that kind of facilitates the memory because funny enough i actually watched the do you follow joe rogan podcast money chance Tansel? yes i do i think the latest one was with um the what was it elon musk elon Have musk you had, yeah. Uh, yeah so i think at the beginning they're talking about you're not the, gonna get me to Il- you're not gonna get me to smoke a joint are you or <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what we were leading up to yeah. <laughs> me and raf already <laughs> So, what happened was at the beginning, um, Elon Musk was talking about the limbic system and the cortex in the brain. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think what he was mentioning is that they were talking about the advancements of technology and to the point where I think, um, uh, I think uh, what's his host now? I forgot the um, bad memory. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, yes. So, Joe Rogan was mentioning how Everything that we just want, like in regards to technology, it, there's no stopping to it. It's just want, 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 even though we're advancing. And then thing, uh, Elon Musk brought up a point about pretty much how the limbic system, I think, uh, um, appeals to your emotions and senses and the cortex is more rational. And people think that your, rash, like your emotions are filtered through the rational kind of thing. But it's actually the rational feeds in, um, justifies your emotional that makes sense so pretty much my point is is that the end base for us as humans is emotional it's not like a rational thing and it's funny you bring that up because you can actually take this into a more memorization skills that the base foundation of it it is kind of emotions it is you know um what how you feel about interacting with a word for example you don't just see it as oh it's just a word i have to repeat over and over again you have an emotional kind of spiritual connection to that word in a way where you're not going to forget it. So it's a kind of um, interesting awakening for me right now. It is, and I would never have thought. Yeah, Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you you know how in Islam we say, you know, see through Allah's eyes and all that sort of stuff is, you know, you're looking at something, right? You're looking at maybe a table. Well, you just see a table, right? Um, Sorry, when I said Allah's eyes, I meant Allah's names. Um, So when you're looking at a table, you think, okay, it's the table. But you might look at that table in a way that goes, wow, we eat on this table, you know, um, Allah's provider and all that sort of stuff. We sit down. We've got somewhere to sit down. So you're showing gratitude just from this one piece of, you know, furniture, right? And so you're involving emotion. When you start doing that, things start not just becoming memorable, but you you get into a different state. use different parts of your brain. It's actually interesting you brought up gratitude because actually one of your articles you mentioned, I think the key to memorization was gratitude. Is this what you're talking about where if you show gratitude to a certain object or a certain word you need to memorize, uh, more than likely you will um, develop that connection that allows you to uh, remember it? Yeah, it doesn't have to be ne- gratitude exactly um, because even the negative has the same effect. Right, you can visualize negative things, bad things happening, and you'll remember it. I mean, you look at TV, media. Why is it all negative? Because that's what people remember. That's what sticks in their head, right? If it was all good, then no one would remember anything, right? You look at it that way. Because there's so much positivity in the world that we miss it all, <laughs> believe it or not, right? But yeah, we remember all the negative things, and this, this is unfortunate because you get people that are so drowned up in this world, they complain about this and that. And to be honest, you know, a lot of Muslims that I meet are like that as well. Not all of them, obviously, but we, we just dramatized, oh, you know, you know, this is happening, such and such. Well, have a look. I mean, what percentage of the world is actually happy? You know, um, so it's looking at things to be not just grateful for, but, you know, what we actually stand for and, you know, what's actually happening in the first place. So that, that, that's how I sort of look at memory as well. In the two extremes, if you go in the mid, in middle, then that doesn't become that memorable. It's just sort of passed upon. Uh, well, so I want to hone in specifically, um, we mentioned about the Quran memorization techniques because I actually read your article about that 
Um, you can correct me if, I wrong, uh, if I'm wrong and I say anything um, that you actually didn't mention, but how I actually got it, and it was actually pretty interesting in regards to technique. You touched on it earlier, but um, each sentence has a story. So what you mentioned in your article was that um, people, they just need the trigger at the first word. And once you got that trigger, you memorize the rest of the, um, you recall the rest of the um, ayah or sentence or whatever. So the whole point, what you mentioned in your article was to make a story out of the first word of each verse. And that will actually trigger the whole um, verse and then you'll be able to remember it easier. So would you say that's kind of the main um, technique in regards to memorizing the Quran? Yeah, absolutely. You, you got it spot on. Now, obviously, there's ayats out there that are quite long, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you got, you know, one page ayat in Surah al Baqarah, right? So you're not going to just memorize Ladies. the start of it and off you go. <laughs> right? So it's, it's all about, um, you know, you memorize it, uh, you recall it up to a certain point. Because uh, the brain, like when it comes to crime memorization, it's all about how to remember the next bit. Because, right? Because we recite, recite, recite until we forget that bit, don't we? Mm-hmm. So once you get to that bit that you forget, that's when you can possibly use another location or you can link them together uh, in an actual story. So there's many ways to actually go about it. And you mentioned, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned the word locus in that article. Um, could you explain further what you mean yeah. by locus? Because I've seen it pop up around a lot of articles as well. Um, it's probably yeah. a technical term that you use for specifically for memorization. So if you could explain what that term means. Yeah, it's 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 not the animal <laughs> locust. <laughs> That's a locust. <laughs> but um, yeah, what what it is essentially when you get a whole bunch of locations, right? So the the whole location system, just just to explain it, right, is in order to memorize. And this is the ancient Greeks came up with this. So in order to memorize things, they they pop them around a certain route or location. So for example, I come in home and I've got a you know uh, I guess a journey that I follow through in my house. So I might come in from the front door. That's my first location. Um, second location might be my bedroom. So I say bed. Third location might be, you know, what's inside my you know, bed. Maybe there's, you know, a drawers, chest of drawers or something like that, right? So a location is a whole collection of these um, spots. And a locus is um, essentially each individual one, right? So my bed is a locus. Um, the chest of drawers is a locus, the front door is a locus, but they all belong to one location, if that So, would sense. you, okay, so for example, you brought up like a house and different rooms. Would that be, would you use that visual representation for, I don't know, for example, memorizing big um, essays or passages or passages from the Quran where, I don't know, for example, you go into a room, uh, actually you go, you walk into a house and something, you use certain objects to help you remember certain you know, I um, beginning yeah. um, verses, for example, beginning of each verse, and then you walk into the bedroom, and then you see, uh, then you try to use visual representations. So locations would be yes. each room is called a location, whereas each specific object would be a locus. Is that correct? Or- so let's let's say um, you've got you know ten locations. Right. Well, it's not really called locations. They're they're called locus. So, for example, door, bed, chest of drawers. These are called locus individually, right? But they all become a part of one location, right? Which is my I can call it my house location. So that's the whole category, essentially. So that's what it is. And when I try to memorize stuff on it, um, I connect it to the locus, right? So, for example, if I was to memorize, say, let's say Surah Al Fatiha, right? Well, the first one's Bismillah, first ayah. So I say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I connect that to the front door. So as soon as I go through the front door uh, or I'm about to open the front door, I say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I connect that to there, right? Then the next one is say Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So we say, let's just take Alhamdulillah, right? And, uh, and bed. So maybe we're lying down in bed saying Alhamdulillah, I can rest now. Do you see yeah, how yeah. that works? So I just connect it like that. Now, obviously, there's going to be words there that people don't understand. I mean, I don't speak Arabic. I don't understand it. I only know the Quranic words. Um, but so you have to somehow make up uh, an image from that, right? So that, that's how that works. Wow. So how, how do you draw the re- relationship between the Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and the door walking through? Is it um, 
do you and the other question would be are you, you like for example when i think of you're using a house for example i think of my own house at the moment with all the objects i know where everything is my bed's there this and that do you put meaning onto those objects or do you build your own house and put meaning and objects into wherever you want yeah, you build your own house. You, you have to use your own um, because the reason why you use your own, it's easier for you to remember <laughs> and um, take it from there. So that's what you do. You build your own locations, your locus around your house. Uh, and it doesn't have to be your house. It could be your workplace, could be your school, university, wherever. Uh, I've got hundreds of them. So the, the aim is to essentially you know, use them to memorize something in order. So that's what the technique's for. Oh, okay, because... Me personally, I like using stuff that I already know, but it could be that maybe it is more like probably you're obviously the more skilled in this department. Like you build your own kind of house and put the objects where you want. It's actually easier to memorize. But just from me, from my own experiences now, I feel like I like, I don't know, I like copying. I don't know if we're in an exam, you just copy the person next to you. So <laughs> you, you copy kind of what you already know, if that makes sense. And you just apply meaning to yeah. each object. But that it could vary for different person you reckon or yeah it varies i mean you have your own sort of systems in place and you use that no that's really interesting and i I think i'm just blown away by this whole thing in general i would never have thought that memory was like if you had to say three words to to describe what are the best ways to memorize i would never think of curiosity imagination and emotion as three important key parts of memory and then Linking that, I think one of the other common themes that you've touched upon is linking that back to something familiar to you. So if you're trying to remember a name, try and remember someone else with that name. Or if you're trying to remember more abstract things, try and link it back to something like your own home, which is the most familiar thing to you. So all of these things like familiarity and and it, it, it's, it's just, yeah, it's completely blown me away. I'm kind of thinking about everything. And, and, yeah, and if you want to remember things... Sorry, I'll cut you off. No, I just, it's, it's changed my whole perspective on, on memorization. As soon as, you know, I leave you, I'm going to go and I'm going to try and memorize my essays using these techniques. <laughs> see, see where it gets. I should have done this interview before yeah, my HSC. It would have been actually really good before, <laughs> before I had to go and do my exams last semester. <laughs> it could be a good case study then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But I suppose the, the, the thing I really want to get into as well is like, how do, is it really the same formula for? Everyone. I mean, you're a memory coach, I think you mentioned. Yeah. So you're working with individual human beings. Do you give them all the same advice when it comes to memory? The human beings? Yeah. 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 The individual <laughs> as human opposed beings to, I do. As opposed to the, you know, the cats and the dogs that you have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I, I do different techniques with them. But um, yeah. with, with the human beings, right, the, here's how I do it. I don't just show them techniques, right, because it's, it's kind of pointless. Uh, I always listen to what their problems are. Right? People come to me with problems. People come to me with challenges. They say, yeah, I've got a bad memory. Right? Mm-hmm. And I say, okay. I, I delve deeper. I say, okay, tell, tell me about your memory. What's going on? What's happening? And they might say, oh, I can't remember names. Right? I say, you know, what happens when you try to remember a name? So I diagnose. Right? I get in like a doctor. I try and see what's going on. And funny enough, what happens is that sometimes it's not about memory. Right? It could be about confidence. Right? I had one client that he couldn't remember names and that was because he was lacking in confidence, right? Not so much that he had a bad memory. Another person was, you know, not sleeping right. And as soon as we fixed their sleeping patterns, guess what? They started remembering, right? Or they, they were in a state to remember better. So it's, sometimes it's not all about memorization. But um, if it is about memorization, then I say, okay, here's how we can solve that problem or take it further. And here are the techniques and tools to help you with stress or help you with anxiety or help you to, to lose weight or memorize Quran or whatever it is that's going to help people to, you know, make the most of their mental capacity. That's, that's really, really interesting. Do you think that uh, physical health and, and memory are intertwined at all in that, in that sense? Like, Sorry, I missed that last bit. Do you think that physical health and memory are intertwined at all? Well, yeah, healthy body, healthy mind. Um, mm-hmm. It's quite powerful. I mean, you can have the best mind in the world, but if you're physically not capable, it's it's gonna, you know, affect so many areas of your life. Um, same thing, the opposite. You could be really fit but depressed <laughs> as well. So you got to be able to train both areas. We know how to train physically, right? I think everyone knows, but no one knows how to train 
mentally, in a mental state. People think, oh, yeah, do Sudoku or play some apps on your phone. That That's not training. <laughs> All this stuff that we're talking about, encoding, creating visual capabilities, um, emotions, feelings, that that's the kind of training you need to do. A lot of the things that I do with my clients is um, I, I – get to say to them, look, what do you want to achieve, right? So let's maybe I'll ask you that question. So if I asked you, what, what would you love to achieve? What could you tell me? Um, as in what's our goal personally? Something in life, yeah, just one thing in life that you'd really love to achieve. Um, make Boys in the Cave the biggest podcast the world has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So you've got that, right? Now, you, I want you to be able to visualize that, right? Can, can you visualize that? Yeah, like I step into mass year, everyone knows my name. <laughs> Joe Rogan comes in like right? yeah, and he's like, "Oh man, your podcast is incredible." <laughs> yeah, so I want you to picture it like it's already happened. Imagine it's already happened, right? How does that make you feel? Makes me feel, makes me feel a sense of gratitude. But then I feel like there's more to it because if you've already done like. Since I have the drive for Boys in the Cave to accomplish something, I feel like there's more to be done, even though we're the best, we would be the best podcast at that point in time. I don't know, like I'd still want to find a different goal, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But let's say you've accomplished it, you've got it, right? It's done. You've achieved it. Well, how do you feel now? A bit not that great. I don't know. What What do you mean, bro? Like you've done, like, no, no, there's the satisfaction part already done. And then afterwards, what do you do? Like, (laughs) you can't be on, bro, like, no, like, think about it, like. I won, like, for example, cricket awards when I was young, and I probably aim to achieve after you get it. Ten years later, I don't care about any. You know what I mean? That's yeah. that's what I feel. But I mean, we're we're always looking at uh, continuous improvement. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. All that sort of stuff. So, so I get it, I get it. But you know, a goal is like a project. You know, it's um, you know, you set a particular task, and you you know, tasks to achieve that. And once you achieve it, you achieve it, and then you move along to somewhere else. Mm. So the point I'm trying to get at here is that the brain can't differentiate between what's real and what's not right it, it doesn't know so when i said how does it feel well, once you've achieved that goal um you get that feeling straight away don't you You said you know when i walk into the masjid everyone knows you and joe rogan comes and shakes your hand you know he's high on dmt or whatever he is yeah, yeah. he's in the masjid he offers you a voice of the cave he, 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 he offers you a blunt <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So he's in the cave doing his, you know, whatever. So you know, th- this is stuff that because you're you visualize it happening, it doesn't know if it's real or not. So the thing is, and this is, you know, it blew my mind when I first thought about it as well. Is you know, we tend to think about the the past a lot, right? Of oh, this happened, that happened, and we think about the future a lot, right? Oh, this is going to happen, blah 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 blah, and it's all sort of negative. Now. Can we change the past? No. Yes or no? No, we can't. Unless you have like a time machine or something, but otherwise. Well, there, well, guess what? You can change the past, right? In your head, you can change. Wow. Now, whatever's happened, happened, right? We know that in reality, it's happened. But we can change the image of it, of what's happened in our head. So let's say something traumatic happened, right? In the past. Let's say you broke a fingernail <laughs> or something like that, right? Something highly <laughs> traumatic. Now, you, you've already got... Uh, a story behind it, right? You've got emotions behind it. It's, you know, you don't want to think of it ever again, right? But what you can do is you can change that story and you can make it less impactful. You can make it less colorful, right? So if you try and reverse the way that we actually memorize, because remember when we're memorizing, we're making it more visual, we're involving more emotion. If you do it the opposite way, that's going to help you forget, right? It's going to help you forget. It's going to lessen the load in your brain. And the good thing is with the future is because the future hasn't happened, we can make up any story we want, <laughs> right? It doesn't have to be, oh, no, this is going to happen, whatever. Well, if you're making negative things, why not make positive things, right? Saying tomorrow I'm going to make 50 grand or Joe Rogan's going to come, you know, shake my hand, all this sort of stuff, right? So you can make it up. Yeah, it's not going to happen, maybe. Who knows? But at least you're making something positive up that your brain's going to like as opposed to something negative because it's going to drag you down negative way, whereas positive is going to drag you into the positive way. So that's, that's the way that you can really hack into your brain, hack into your mind to really you know, achieve that success. That's really interesting because I think you're getting at something really important. And I've actually heard some, I think it might have been Hansa Tsortis or someone who talked about the power of the brain and how, for example, 
I think people, when they go about life, they have this nice, beautiful image of everything going right. It's obviously good to have a vision, but they just expect everything to go that way. And if they fall short or anything um, doesn't go their way, they're, you know, um, sad about it, they're heartbroken, et cetera, et cetera. So what, um, yeah. I forgot who talked about this, but what he mentioned was that what you visualize, it's like what you said, it's like the power of the mind. So you just visualize the worst possible scenario you could ever be in your life and you just play it out as an image. Mm-hmm. So it, like it feels real. Mm-hmm. And like for me, yeah. I've actually done this a few times. So for me personally, it was like, because um, I have a lot of stuff that I do, like projects and stuff. So I, sometimes I wonder, you know, if you don't make it successful in the um, specific business career, What's going to happen? Maybe you end up on the street as the worst possible example. Like on the street, you got nothing else. You have nowhere to go. So I actually visualize that per like, okay, you're going to, and then you work out what would you do then? You know, would you go stay here? Would you go there? Go to this masjid? So you actually work everything out like a, you play it out like a story. And once you've actually thought it through and you've actually thought about it and then you reflect on, you know, hope and gratitude in that moment, but then you know what to do in that, in the moment of hardship and turmoil. And then you go back to reality. It's like you've played it out in your mind. You know what to do when you're there. You just go about what you do in a positive way because you already know in the worst possible scenario what you're going to do, if that makes sense. So that's like how powerful yeah. the, the brain and the, and the memory is. And I think that's actually personally helped me as well. It's a sort of psychological thing as well. It prepares you. But yeah. yeah. Although one, one big problem I can see from that is the more you visualize that negative Thing or the worst possible scenario happening, you're putting your, you know, your your whole body on a cellular level um, connect to negative stuff mm. as well. So you know, we, we need to do the opposite of that. You need to look at the best case scenario and visualize the best case scenario. Now you're probably thinking, well, I can visualize best case, but what if it doesn't happen? I'm going to be up for disappointment, right? Mm. Um, well, you, again, figure out a best case scenario from there and from there. Yeah. So you're always moving ahead in a positive way yes fear is a motivator as well in a lot of instances um if that works but you know why not do it always happy instead of looking back into struggles yeah there's always going to be struggles there's always going to be good and bad but you know if you really want to move your vi- and there's vibrations right if we want to move into a positive vibration and attract all that positive stuff you, you need to go there directly rather than go backwards because going backwards might, you know, um, in the process uh, be a negative thing for you as well. It's got super deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty emotional. I think people, this is probably a jam-packed of an episode. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we've gone from yeah. talking to dogs and cats about memorization. And we've and Joe Rogan offering us <laughs> positive and negative energy in life. It's quite a traversal. But yeah, for those of us who are much more capitalist-minded and yeah, we care about money, <laughs> Uh, how important or how can we utilize memory techniques for a business or for marketing purposes? Uh, I'm sure they play quite an important role in, in marketing psychology and in business psychology as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th- this is what I specialize in as well is, you know, I, I help people to actually be memory coaches and consultants and experts and, um, you know, I, I help them to make money. Uh, on the side or as a full-time job, whatever it may be. Uh, and the thing is, again, it, it always comes back to, uh, it, it, with anything, if you really want to make money, is how can you be valuable to people? Right? How can you create value? It's not about offering a service or product or anything like that. It's about how can you help someone? People that come to me, that they want an answer. So I have to give them an answer. I don't have to give them coaching. I can say, here, read this or speak to Joe or do whatever as long as they get an answer. So as long as you have answers for people and you solve their problem, right, their pain point, um, then you're always going to make money regardless. Wh- whether it is, you know, coaching someone or whether it is doing a podcast, you know, um, you just got to look at, okay, how can I solve this person's problem or this organization or schools or whatever it is, you know, and once you've figured that out, uh, and then, you know, if you're working on, you know, business, then, you know, want to try and scale that as well. What are all the resources, people, you know, connections, it, everything I need to actually make this work on a larger scale. So yeah, it's quite interesting, yeah. I think, about considering in every business and in every, in every kind of uh, venture in life to try and think about how we're adding value to society and, and creating value for, for other people and how are we making ourselves useful and, and utilizing our skills for the benefit of other people. I think that's really interesting. 
I think that's how I got into this. I sort of stumbled into what I'm doing now. Um, I didn't have, you know, uh, aspirations to be a coach or even teach. I mean, my sister wanted to be the teacher, not me. Uh, I was very introverted. I want to be in computers. I want to be behind the computer. You know, uh, I was always like that since I was nine years old. So, but as I started getting into memory techniques more, you realize that, man, this is something that everyone needs to know. And then it was just a case of how do I get this out to people, right? That, that's all it was. How do I get this out to people? How do I change people's lives? And, you know, I started working with dyslexic kids first. And, you know, there, there was a family, a Muslim family that were um, taking their kids, dyslexic kids, and they were about, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, around there. And uh, they were taking a one-hour drive to another suburb um, every week and, you know, driving back and paying, you know, big bucks. And for a whole year, they did this. And I went in there because the, the sister called me up saying, well, can you help these kids? And I said, oh, well, I can have a look, you know. And I gave them words like this, that, and, you know, very, very basic words. And they couldn't remember any of them. And I thought, wow, these parents are driving all that way, spending thousands of dollars, and these kids can't even spell egg. Um, so really frustrating. So I, I showed them how to, again, visualize the words and make stories up, just very basic stuff. And in 20 minutes, I gave them a whole new set of words and they memorized it perfectly. And the parents were freaking out going, oh my goodness, what's going on? You know, we just, you know, did all this stuff. We've been doing it for a whole year and these kids all of a sudden in 20 minutes, they've improved. You know, well, what's the secret? I'm like, it's not a secret, <laughs> the, the, you know. The person you're seeing is obviously, you know, don't know what they're doing. And these techniques are working. They, they work. So, you know, when you hear stories like that, you just want to push further and further and help more people. So, um, yeah, it, that's, yeah, you just got to look at what value you want to provide people and, you know, and just always look at that helping side. That's actually so, like, that was such a beautiful story because, like, personally, um, you know, when I heard about you in the past, you know, you think of a oh, memory champion, you think of just mem- uh, memorize the yellow pages and that's about it. You just think, oh, it's just some guy. It's he like a token know. thing. Like a burger eating contest. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's, that's just how I uh, know. Um, that's who I think you are just, you know, memorizing a lot of stuff. And now we've actually fleshed out a lot of things. We've actually talked about things about memorizing people's names, like something simple like that to uh, memorizing Quran to now helping dyslexic children with memorization techniques like yeah. now and business minded people how you can you know how you mentioned adding value and then tailoring the memorization to that that actually you know change it's, it's blown me away subhanallah and it's do you feel because you obviously said you kind of fell into this whole situation and then you start seeing doors open for you from different sectors where you know your skills you, you started seeing that these skills that i i've acquired yeah. are suddenly applicable to almost anything Absolutely. I mean, I, I get paid to speak now, you know. <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's not, you know, I get paid anywhere from seven to 11 grand for an, up to an hour. I mean, this wow. is ridiculous figures, right? Or even more than that in some places. So, you know, when you've got this information that people value, right, they, they pay for it. So what have you got out there that people value? The podcast is quite amazing right? Um, and it's about not just having a skill sort or being able to do something that not many people can. It's again, it's about solving a problem. If you can solve that problem, regardless of your expertise and stuff, that's what it comes down to. You know, so the opportunities that open up for me, that they keep opening up because I just keep wanting to help people. Right? That, that's what generally happens. I don't say, you know, I want to you know, do this or I want to do that. Um, you know, I, I sort of dictate how I want to work, but I always look at, okay, how can I give best value to people? That's that's the first question I'm always asking. And then whatever work comes out from that, that that's what I sort of get dragged into. So yeah, speaking, I do a lot because I, I, want, I need to pass this message on. Coaching, I do because I want to really get people up to the next level. Um, I run projects and events as well, purely because, you know, message gets out to larger amount of people. So, you know, I used to do online programs years ago. Um, you know, I even had, you know, Quran memorization programs online. This was, you know, going back 10 years ago. And I had thousands of people on there. So, you know, you always have to look at what's going to bring the best value. Um, the more value you give, the more value you get. <laughs> that's, that's how I sort of see it as. That's actually amazing because it's actually scary that you're bringing this up all now. Like, for example, you mentioned bringing value and that's what you concentrate on. So, for example, you're not 
going in, you're not doing something because a lot of people, they just purely the first objective is to get paid a lot. And that actually affects their workflow because once they get that, they don't care about adding value, right? But for your, from what I'm getting, your um, nature is to see the value, work towards it, see where your skills apply. And then afterwards, if you get paid and stuff, the money will actually come to you. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm getting at. Do you feel that's your kind of approach in regards to all this kind of stuff? Absolutely. Um, just just be and, and be valuable. And the beautiful thing is that we've got the internet now. We've got social media. So I've got every opportunity to be valuable 24-7, you know, um, podcasts, blogs, you know, videos. Um, it's all out there. Just do what you feel that you enjoy doing and get it out to people. Um, you know, so if you've got a message to share, if you've got, you know, even if it's entertainment, entertain people, you know, um, make music if people want to make music, you know, dance, whatever, you know. So as long as you get it out to people um, and people will value it. That's because it, it's scary you're mentioning all this now because um, with Boys in the Cave, personally, a lot of um, stuff has been happening in regards to having partnerships. So, like, what we're trying to do, we have like a vision. But obviously, you've probably <laughs> um, experienced with the podcast. So we moved rooms midway through the pod, um, episode. So um, there's facets where we're kind of um, having things to deal with. So obviously, one would be um, you know all podcasts need money to get started up, kind of thing. And obviously, if you have your own space and all that kind of stuff. So right now, we're recording at University of Sydney, and you know all the or some <laughs> Rafael, you want to explain the situation before the episode how you booked the room basically i I booked one room and then i went on to just confirm the time and everything the booking they were like oh by the way your booking's been rescinded and i was like oh okay you know this this is what happened so i booked a couple of other rooms i went to that room turns out that room was also booked so we had to move halfway through and so we're still dealing with a lot of you know a lot of you know chaos (laughs) so like what i'm essentially saying is that it why I'm bringing this up is that you mentioned value. So, at the end of the day, our objective is to add value to the community and especially, obviously, the Muslim community. And so, maybe, um, inshallah, in the future, if we can keep doing that, there'll be doors that open up for us that can allow us to, you know, for example, have our own space and stuff like that because people will see, um, you know, the value Absolutely. that we're hopefully, you know, providing to the community. So, what I'll actually get your advice on this. Um, what We've, you've got a sort of idea about behind the scenes of Boys in the Cave. What what do you th- what ways um, can we kind of um, add value in a way that allows us to be more efficient and productive in regards to our whole production of Boys in the Cave? I mean, I'm not a podcast sort of specialist, so I wouldn't really know. Um, I, I've done a you know a few of them, obviously, but um, yeah, it's it's more about again just worry about your message. And if your message is powerful enough or your vision is powerful enough, you're going to make things work naturally. Like you'll, you'll probably want to say, no, I don't, I don't I want to, you know, I don't want to have to move every time or I'm going to go into a space and we're going to, get to dedicate this much time and effort. And, you know, you, you'll work all that out. You know, when you're passionate about something, um, it starts to grow on you. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many ways to actually go about it. So the, the whole um, I guess priority is just just get the good value out there to people. Um, share the message. Share your you know entertainment, which is you know um, cool. So yeah, I mean I can't really give you much. Unfortunately, it's probably someone better to help you with there. But I think just from what you're trying to do and your vision, as long as you work on that, um, yeah, things will come your way most definitely. I think it's a really interesting kind of philosophical approach too, because. A lot of times in society now we're taught, like we're asked from a very young age, what are you going to be when you're older? In terms of where are you going to make your mark in this world? And, and continually asking that question rather than asking what do you want to do and being encouraged to do what you want to do and understand yourself and do those things which you're skilled at and then trying to create value out of that. You know, it's almost like we're being forced in a lot of ways down particular avenues by society. Uh, oh, yeah. As opposed to, you know, uh, finding out about ourselves, mastering our skills, and showing where, and really questioning as to where we can value the society as as human beings, not rather how will we fit into this this great cog. And I think that that's something that you really embodied in your work. Yeah, I, I don't think it fits into a, a lot of people's agendas mm-hmm. at the top. <laughs> if you were to <laughs> ask that question. Um, 
So that wouldn't work that way. But, you know, it's you're right. Once you start sort of looking at it that way, then, you know, then you look at the whole you know, thing as a whole and say, okay, do I really have to study? Or do I really have to do this degree? Or do I really need this and that? And so it suddenly becomes like, oh, wow, you're saying that I can coach people now. But I had this one guy who spent over 25 grand just for a coaching program to become a coach, right? And he goes, yep, after three years, I get my diploma, blah, blah, blah. I could start coaching people. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Um, so, and I asked him a question. I said, I, can you help people now? right? Um, with all your skill set, are you able to help people now? And he looked at me and said, yeah, I can. I said, well, why just you spend all this money? Go and help people now. Go make your money now. You know, it's not knowing some extra knowledge and stuff. That'll come. I mean, I never did any coaching programs or anything like that. I just purely did it because I wanted to help people. That in itself is good enough. Now, I'm not saying go out and don't do any degrees or diplomas or whatever. Some things, the answer's right there in front of us, but we don't do it. We delay it because we say, oh, we need this extra skill or we need to do this or we need to confirm this. Well, it's not the case. Do you think that kind of like a, not, not so much like a confidence issue, but do you think it's more like a psychological issue that, like, or do you think people, because we, we often make excuses for ourselves. Do you think that's kind of an example of that? Like, oh, I'll, I'll do this once I've achieved this or once I've done this or once I've secured this um, as opposed to just getting in and, and, and doing yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. That's what delays people and delays happiness and success and money and all that sort of stuff. You're going to get in there and just absolutely do it. And the successful people in the world, they're the ones that actually go in, do, 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 fail, fail, fail many, many times. Um, but because I failed so many times, they know how to readjust, right? They know how to readjust. So it's like Michael Jordan, classic example. Right, he always says he's failed thousands and thousands and thousands of times. That's what makes him a champion and success, right? So you got to be able to just go in there, and, and people are scared of the unknown, right? There's a fear of the unknown out there, so they only know what they're confident of, right? And you're only confident if you've um, put in the time and effort to actually know it, right? So that's why people are scared to jump into the deep end. Right, because they're not that confident. But if you're able to jump in the deep end, you'll eventually learn how to swim. You won't drown in, in this sense because it's just readjusting and, and learning. That's the most learning that happens is when you do these mistakes. Now imagine if you know if schools actually gave us the you know, our mistakes for the answers for exams and stuff. I mean, you'll learn a lot more, but they don't even do that. <laughs> so you don't know if what you've passed and what you've failed. Um, in some instances anyway, with the end of year type of stuff. So, yeah, so that's how I see it is you go in, uh, work your butt off, whatever you do, make mistakes along the way, learn from them, readjust and go at it again instead of saying, you know, I'll do it once I'm such and such. Or I'll do it once, you know, she's done this. <laughs> you know, it's all up to you. That's actually pretty profound because – um, what you realize is that, for example, um, even me personally, people, you know, they say, yeah, I want to do something because I do, I study commerce. So, you know, oh, yeah, I want to do something businessy. Let's just do a business uh, commerce degree and they just enroll in that. And then when they finish, like, oh, yeah, like I want to do something businessy. I'm going to look for the job now. Whereas what you kind of emphasize from the starting point is about what's your vision, what's your goal and what you should, what's your end kind of goal at the end of the day. So if you want to be a business owner, for example, why are you doing a degree and stuff? You can literally build connections now. Um, and it's always, it's always those type of Absolutely. guys where you see that it's like, a, it's, like, it's like the analogy I like to use is the herd of sheep. So everyone will go one mode of way of doing something. But then there's always that one guy you notice in your group is just like they do some weird stuff like behind the scenes and they just like reach the goal quicker and more efficiently than how you've perceived it to be, which is the traditional method, I don't know, going university. So it makes you kind of think it through a bit more and you have to realize that it's more about the vision and with vision comes efficiency, I reckon. And then you'll, you know, inshallah, reach the goal that you, you've set out for yourself. Because even, you know, you can as a young kid, like I know you see stories about 17, 16 year old kids, they're running like businesses. Why? Because they, they had that, you know, zeal in their age in regards to vision. They know, look, I have this product. I'm going to market it and I'm going to start mastering the metrics of the social media, you know, realm and do this and that. And probably some peer next to him is just like, yeah, I'm going to study uh, commerce at university and afterwards um, learn the skills and maybe uh, run a business. So it's passion. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th- those skills. I mean, social media now. Now kids are getting into that stuff, and they know how to market way better than you know uh, a lot of companies out there. And mm. companies are using these kids now as influencers. You know, <laughs> so it, it's amazing how things are going around in circle. But the more and more people realize this, the more and more power they have. Right? They go, oh wow! Now you're saying I can do this, or you know, instead of sitting five years of whatever, you know, um, not not necessarily I'm talking about uni, but it could be you know anything else out there. Because <laughs> Raphael's signaling to me, he's got class in like ten yeah, minutes. He's <laughs> at <laughs> uni, so he has to like rush off to a class. But regardless, um, before we actually wrap things up, let's try to memorize the phrase or the word. No, let's, <laughs> the let's see if we can still remember them. Hey, Do you remember the name? Jellyfish Bob. <laughs> and uh, the, the guy big who, one. The guy who okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the big the one. The guy who suffers from Claudia. Yeah, yeah Claudia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the one, the big one you gave me was um, VJ um, Arong Gun. Um, was it, uh, Chan, Chan? No, no, no. Something Chan, before that. Yeah. But then the end one was Chandran. The, the Rama. Rama, that's yeah. it. Yeah, so... <laughs> It's actually worse. Yeah, it does. it does. That's actually amazing. So, uh, are you um, going to hire us now? For- yeah, yeah, <laughs> We're, we've mastered the skill here. You don't need me now. You can go and teach others. But, Zakhullah Tanzu, for coming on Bookers in the Cave. It's been really, I think it's been uh, jam packed. You know, we talked about, you know, psychology. We've talked it's about, incredible. yeah, Quran memorization techniques, um, how to go about live vision goals. So I think, inshallah, it's a lot of um, benefit for our um, listeners. And um, if people want to kind of actually, if you just Google your name, you're like, I think two nights ago, or last night even, I was just going through Google. You, you've got like a non ending amount of articles and videos. Like, you've got so much content out there. So I was actually sifting through. I'm like, man, I'm never going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to keep going and going. So you're actually eva- adding value in that sense, which is um, humble, amazing to see. Because I've also seen um, um, you've actually worked with, you know, MSAs, I think, in around um, Australia. I think a friend told us you got invited to Sumsa, but something happened um, in UCID. So you're actually adding all that value in that sense. So it's amazing to see. And if someone, um, one of our audience wanted to see, um, get more information about you, um, where do they head to or even join, um, I don't know, one, if you have like an online class or mentoring or anything? Yeah. Um, they can just go to my website, tansalali.com. And um, yeah, they can contact me through there or read some of the lessons, all that sort of stuff. Or if anyone's got a suggestion really for a lesson, I'm happy to write it out as well. Because like I said, I'm trying to get some value out there. I'm, I'm not the most regular person or I don't blog or audio or video regularly. But, you know, if people sort of ask for it, I'll do it. So, um, yeah, tansalali.com is the uh, website. Because yeah, I saw you went on a few other podcasts as well. So, I, I guess when you people are giving you the opportunity, you're, you're jumping on board to add that value, quote unquote. Yeah. And thank you so much. for that. Yeah. yeah. You absolutely have something amazing of incredible value to everyone with it. Any any single human can can use and utilize in some way, and so yeah, I think we're all very grateful, Tanzim and I, and I implore all of the listeners to go and and to to do some research into your ideas and your writings because uh, it's something incredibly profound, it's something incredibly positive, and it's something that we all need. Thank you, thanks for the kind words, and I um, look forward to uh, seeing you guys with Joe Rogan. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> smile a lot. Like even you, um, you know, being Muslim and. Obviously, very proud because I was surprised because um, the articles about memorizing techniques of the Quran isn't like on the first page of Google. I had to kind of sift through your LinkedIn and stuff and I found, I came across it. So, you know, it's about people picking up on these skills and adding value to the, even to the Muslim community because, you know, we're obviously a minority in Australia and we want to add some, you've got a specific niche. So, everyone's coming to you about something. So, it's about, everyone doesn't have to be you, but they can be the best version of themselves as well. Yeah. Good one. Sweet. So for all listeners, thank you for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at we've changed our email to info at boysinthecave.com. We've we're pretty legit now. Before it used to be boys in the cave yeah, at, at gmail. gmail.com. But we've well we're, we're making a big now home with us. So I'll uh, find us on Facebook and you can also follow follow our journey through Instagram. And we also st- uh, have our new website up and running, boysinthecave.com. We've got articles, we've got our um, podcast episodes up there. And you can even send um, your email or message us through there as well. And also, please leave a five-star rating on iTunes as that greatly helps us go up the rankings, inshallah. So, if you want to 
message us or meet us uh free feel free to kind of message us on all any of our platforms in and we're pretty active on it as well so we'll definitely respond to your messages and we'll also send links of our guest Hansel Ali stuff on our show notes so people want to check um, his website out inshallah so from our special guest Hansel Ali Raphael and myself we wish you all the best this is Tanzim signing you off assalamu alaikum